Good morning. As you can see, this is the house of the Lord. There's joy in this place because we know the living Savior, Jesus Christ. Carl, thank you very much for moving today. Um, things that you said, brother, I appreciated that. The Lord spoke to my heart. Well, thank you for coming. <laughs> I knew you thought it was all over when I picked up the guitar. <laughs> this morning, we are back in the book of Luke chapter 22. It's about the betrayal, arrest, and trial of Jesus Christ, at least his religious trial. Next week, we get into his civil trial. And so as we look at this, let's just ask the Lord to speak to our hearts today. Father, as we look at this historical event, as we look at this spiritual event, as we look at this tragic event, I pray that you might help us to know something more of you and something more of ourselves that we might respond to you in a way that deepens our affection and our relationship with you. Lord, we live in a fallen world. We live in a sinful place. We were raised by sinful parents, lived in a sinful world, and we are inhabiting a sinful body. And yet, Lord, you sent your son to die for us so that we might be free from the bondage of sin in our lives and from the guilt of it. There is joy in the house of the Lord today. I pray, Lord, that you speak to us by your word as we open it up. We know that it is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, that it separates between bone and marrow, between soul and spirit, and it is the judge, the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So, Lord, have your way with each one of us as the songs and communion have softened our heart. Help us to hear your voice. In Jesus' name, amen. It says in Luke 22, verses 67 and 68, the high priest and the Sadducees were questioning Jesus, and they said, if you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, if I tell you, you will by no means believe. And if I ask you, you will by no means answer me or let me go. And Jesus said, what do you want to you want to convert? <laughs> I don't think so. And Jesus said, it doesn't matter what I tell you. You've already made up your mind and you figured it out and you're going to have me crucified. And he knows that. And he goes and he does it willingly. So last week, we looked at Jesus's last meal when he was with the disciples. We went over to the John passage where he washes their feet. He says, you don't know what it is that I'm doing for you now, but you will. And Jesus is saying goodbye to his disciples. He's already given Judas, Judas Iscariot a piece of bread, which was dipped in wine. He gave it to him, and it says, he gave it to him, and Satan entered him. And he said, do what you must do quickly. And Judas left in a hurry. Jesus began to tell everyone that somebody's going to betray him. He says, the hand of the betrayer is with me here at the table. <laughs> I'm sure they all took their hands off the table, and then they had a big argument over who's the greatest in the midst of Jesus trying to confide. And Jesus said, you guys need to be servants and not rulers like the Gentiles. You need to know that to be the greatest, you have to be the servant of all. And he demonstrates this with a show and tell. He takes off his outer garment. He wraps himself in a towel. He fills a basin with water, and he goes and he washes the disciples' feet. Of course, he comes to Peter, who's always a fixture at every gathering. And he says, you'll never wash my feet. And he was quickly rebuked by Jesus. And then he responded in his overacting, overcompensating manner. He said, well, then my hands and my head as well. And he says, you don't need to do that. You're already clean because of the word that I've spoken to you, but not every one of you is clean. And he was speaking of Judas Iscariot. Interesting. I wonder what Judas is thinking as Jesus is washing his feet and showing him yet another act of love and giving him patience before he went. We looked at Jesus as he left that last supper and went down through the brook Kidron, which was running with blood at this time because of the Passover and going up into the Garden of Gethsemane, which was uh, on the Mount of Olives. Gethsemane means the 
olive press. This is a place where Jesus was definitely pressed and out of his pores came sweat mingled with blood as it dripped down to the ground, much like grapes would be squeezed, much like communion that we just had. And Jesus shed his blood not just on Calvary, but he started here in Gethsemane. And he said, Lord, if it be your will, make this cup pass for me, but not my will, but your will be done. And aren't you glad that little butt is in there? And Jesus says, I'll go. He prays three times with his disciples. Of course, he's got nine of them over here. He's got three of them over here, and then he's off by himself. I'm sorry, he's got nine. He's got eight and three. And he says, just stay up and pray with me. And Jesus rises up from prayer in verse 45. And he comes to his disciples and he found them sleeping from sorrow. And it's the wee hours of the morning. And he said to them, why do you sleep? Rise and pray that you enter not into temptation. And he does this three times. We know because John tells us he did this three times. He wants his disciples to just be awake with him in his last hours of freedom. And he knows what's coming because Judas has gone and gotten all of the Sadducees and the elders and the scribes and they're on their way with torches and lanterns and they're ready to take Jesus into custody because their betrayer knows where he spends the night. He spends the night in the garden. So this week we're going to look at his betrayal, arrest, and trial. Verse 47 begins, And while he was still speaking, behold, a multitude... And he was called Judas, one of the 12, went before them and he drew near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the son of man with a kiss? Can you think of a, a more different way to point somebody out instead of there he is, that's him, and point your finger? Judas goes and kisses him. I find that significant because Jesus didn't stand out with a halo over his head. He looked like all the other guys. He had to be pointed out in a way that was unmistakable. And so he goes and he kisses Jesus on the cheek to signify that it's him. I think, my goodness, how do you do something like that? And so there's this gigantic crowd around Jesus. It wasn't just a couple of people. It was an overwhelming force to come and take Jesus. And they're, they're all traveling with lights and with swords to come and take him out of the garden. It says here in John 18, beginning in verse 4, And Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, he went forward and he said to them, Whom are you seeking? And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth, and Jesus said to them, I am he. If you notice, the he is inserted. It has parentheses. Jesus said, I am. The covenant name of God, which was revealed to Moses upon the mountain. He says, I don't even know your name. He says, tell him I am sent you. The great I am. The one, the self-existent one, the one that has always been and always will be. That's what I am is. And Jesus said, I am. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. Now when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell on the ground. You know what it's like if you're at a concert and everyone's kind of crowding and suddenly you need to make way. Everyone has to take a step back. But it's the people in the front row that know to take the step back. It's the people behind you don't know that. And the people behind them don't know that. And so they step back and they fall over each other like a bunch of Keystone cops unless it was the power of his confession. And I'm open for you folks to argue about which it is later. But they all fall to the ground and, you know, they're carrying torches and they're, you fall down on somebody with a torch, something's going to catch fire. You're not going to walk away with all your hair, maybe your eyebrows. And they all fall back. And Jesus, therefore, knowing all things, he says, who are you seeking? I want you to notice something, guys. Jesus is in absolute and complete control here. 
And we don't find that out here in the book of Luke, these particular details, but the eyewitness account of John tells us this. And then he asked them again, whom are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus answered, I have told you that I am. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled in which he spoke of those whom you gave to me, I have lost none. See, they come into the garden, he gets kissed by Judas, and he goes, who are you seeking? Who's in trouble? As though he didn't know. Jesus of Nazareth. I'm here. Here I am. I am. <laughs> they all fall back, and then Jesus says, who are you looking for? You know, once they get up and put the fire out, who are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth. Well, I already told you I'm he. Let these go. These are not the droids you're looking for. <laughs> you may go. You see, where did, where did they get that line from that movie? Where did they get They got it from right here. <laughs> Jesus said, if you're looking for me, then let them go. Do you see how he is interposing his will upon everything that's happening? And Jesus is in absolute control of everything that's happening here. He volunteers himself and he says, well, if it's true what you say that you're looking for me, here I am, take me and let these go. It'd be pretty good to be a disciple and hear Jesus do that. Jesus taking the hit. Jesus is in complete control here. This wasn't a surprise. And he's controlling every movement of what they do. A gigantic contingent of soldiers could have taken them all, but they didn't. They just took Jesus because Jesus said, if it's true that you're looking for me, here I am, let these go. Because he said that he would lose none that the Father gave to him, except for the son of perdition who was already predestined to do such a thing. And when, they, when those around him saw what was going to happen, meaning the disciples, they said to him, meaning Jesus, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? Because you remember Jesus was making it a point at the Last Supper. Listen, if you've got an extra jacket, make sure you get rid of that and get yourself a sword. And Peter says, well, listen, we got two. He goes, that's enough. Apparently, Jesus is trying to arm these guys. Two swords against an army? No. But Peter, misunderstanding perhaps what Jesus said, or maybe out of fear, decides he's going to lash out. And one of them... I love how Luke is being very gentle here and not mentioning Peter by name. And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus answered and said, permit even this. And he touched the ear and he healed him. They all press in. Here's the high priest who's the official. He's got the warrant in his hand. He's got his, the guy, you know, probably some young guy standing next to him. And that's the one Peter decides he's going to lash out at first. Tries to get ahead and he only gets an ear. And Jesus goes and picks up his ear. I don't know if he dusted it off or... Yeah, you know. Let's get this cleaned up. And he puts his ear on and heals him. Now, if you were a soldier in the army coming to take care of a man who said that he was the son of God... And these guys wanted to have him killed. And you saw a miracle like that. Wouldn't that change what you do? <laughs> Miracles don't change people's hearts. Miracles don't change people's hearts. Only God does. Amen. And if God can't do it, a miracle's not going to do it. You could travel all the world over and try to find miracles and all these bizarre and wild things. You can surf the internet and find all sorts of weirdness. It will not change your heart unless God changes your heart. And so Peter decides, I'm going to take you all on. I guess I appreciate his fleshly, man-like manner. But it's not what Jesus had in mind. And he takes this guy who we find from another passage, his name is Malchus. And he just picks up his ear and puts it back on. Demonstrating he's the creator and the healer. You remember in Matthew 26, 52 to 53, Jesus said to him, put your sword in its place for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Matthew tells us this, the words of Jesus at this event. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions 
of angels, 12 legions of angels. That's a whole lot of angels. And by the way, one angel killed 185,000 men in one night. Jesus says, don't you think I'm in control here? I just want to remind you, by the way, Jesus never needs to be defended. You ever feel like you got to defend Jesus? Ah, yeah. oh, you Christians. Oh, yeah? <laughs> I'm going to defend Jesus. Right. Not really. And Jesus said to the chief priests, captains of the temple, and the elders who had come to him, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you daily in the temple, you did not try to seize me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. Jesus was impervious to being captured because it wasn't time. And trust me, boys and girls, you're not going to go home and meet him until you're ready. Until the Lord has everything done just exactly like he wants in your life. Some of you might be wishing to go home and be with the Lord. And yet, we have work to do while we're here. Because the one thing you can't do when you get to heaven is preach the gospel to somebody who's lost. That time will be over. So just to give you a quick timeline so that you understand what's happening, this is the 14th of Nisan. This is on Thursday. These are the events, and you'll see how the scriptures are somewhat scattered and covering all of the details. And so it's good to have something like this. Usually if you have a good study Bible, it will show you how you can flip from one to the other and kind of follow the timeline. So this is the timeline I'm following so that you know. Luke does not cover him going to Annas, who's not the high priest, but he used to be the high priest, and he's kind of the power behind the high priesthood. Luke has him going directly to Caiaphas, and he kind of doesn't talk about Annas, but Luke tells us, or I'm sorry, John tells us, so in John chapter 18, as they take him from the garden, they take him to Annas first. Then a detachment of troops and the captain of the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him, and they led him away to Annas first. For he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was a high priest that year. Now it was Caiaphas who advised the, the Jews that it was expedient or it was convenient that one man should die for the people because Jesus was making so much trouble in Jerusalem and getting power away from these sarcastic religious rulers that they were so competitive, they wanted to kill Jesus. These are supposedly religious people. Religion can be something that kills you. Relationship is something that saves you. Yeah. Annas was considered the true high priest, obviously, uh, priests aren't elected and put in. They're installed, and that's, that's it. It's a done deal. But the Romans stepped in, and they didn't like Annas because Annas was a conservative, and he couldn't be dealt with, and he wouldn't be politically correct. And so they said, well, you step aside and let Caiaphas step up because Caiaphas would bend and weave, and he would you know, kowtow to them, and he had kind of a relationship with them where they would get along, and he wasn't as conservative as Annas, his father-in-law, was. So they go to Annas. Annas is actually the one who has John the Baptist beheaded, if you remember. So he, Annas is considered the true high priest. He ruled from 87 to AD 15. And Caiaphas was a Roman appointee to the office, and he ruled from AD 18 to AD 37. This is a a political scene that Jesus has plunked into, but also he's in control of all of this. So they take him to Annas first. And John 18 continues the story in verse 19. The high priest then asked Jesus about his disciples and his doctrine. By the way, they considered Annas the true high priest. Caiaphas was just kind of there as a political appointee. And Jesus answered him, I spoke openly to the world. I always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where the Jews always meet. And in secret, I have said nothing. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard me what I said to them. Indeed, they know what I said. And when he had said these things, one of the officers who stood, stood by Jesus struck him with the palm of his hand, saying, do you answer the high priest like that? And Jesus answered him, 
If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why do you strike me? And then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. So Jesus gets smacked before he's even seen. All of this is completely inappropriate for a man to be tried under the Jewish law. It had to be in a court, not in a home. It had to be before your judges. And the judges could have nothing to do with your capture and your arrest for a very good reason. It has a way of tainting you. And in verse 54, it says, and having arrested him, they led him and brought him to the high priest's house. But Peter followed at a distance. So we're given part two where he's now going to see Caiaphas and Peter is in the background and he's following Jesus from a distance. We understand from John that John was actually able to go into the court, but Peter couldn't. John had a relative on the inside and he was able to get into the court to see what was happening. And this is in the wee hours of the morning before the sun came up. And yet they're all gathered, ready to have court. Interesting. What a happenstance. Following Jesus from a distance is the loneliest place to be. Here's Jesus who said, I am willing to die and go to death with you. I'm, I'm willing to do anything, go to prison with you. And Jesus said, no, you're going to deny me three times. And here's Peter cowering in the darkness, following the long line of torches to Caiaphas's house. I've been in that place, standing at a distance from Jesus. In my walk with him, I have not always been close. And there are times when I've been very much alone, following at a distance. And it's the worst place to be. It's close enough to feel guilty <laughs> that you should be closer. And yet it's far enough away that you're alone. It's really the worst place to be if you're in Christ. Now, when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard, this is after Peter was ushered in because John got him in, and sat down together, Peter sat among them. And a certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat by the fire, looked intently at him and said, this man was also with him. That's, that's, that's what you want when you're trying to be quiet and not seen. But he denied him, saying, woman, I do not know him. Now, this is the first of what we understand to be Peter's three denials of Jesus. And we find that once he gets into the court, he settles in with all the other spectators, with the people that brought him in, except he gets recognized by a young servant girl. And he's so intimidated by this little girl that he denies Christ. I find that amazing. What would it take for you? A gun to your head? A knife to your throat? An angry look? A sneer? It's an amazing thing. He's warming himself at the enemy's fire and pretending not to be his. He's pretending to be one of them. Did you ever try to be a chameleon and kind of blend in with the unbelievers? I remember going to a bar after I had accepted Jesus Christ and, you know, doing unthinkable things and carousing and drinking. And I remember sitting back and saying, what am I doing here? I never did that. I was always in it. Doing shots, whatever, singing, being stupid. I didn't care. But now I'm there and I'm looking around and I'm like, what am I doing here? Somehow I didn't fit anymore. I didn't belong here. That's the way Peter was. He didn't belong there. He's just trying to keep warm, trying to, I want to see what happens to Jesus, but I want anybody to recognize me and he gets found out. Denying Jesus can become a hard habit to break. This is the first time that he denies Jesus. And I remember week after week, I would continue to go to this same bar. And week after week, I'd say, what am I doing here? And I'd try to, hey, 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 hey. my heart wasn't in it anymore. And I just said, what am I doing here? It's a very ha bad habit to break. Once you've met Jesus, 
You will never fit in again, but you'll never be alone. I can tell you, once you have come into a relationship with God through Jesus Christ as your Savior, you'll never be alone, but you'll never be able to fit in ever again. I remember mourning that fact. I'll never fit in ever again. And there are friends I once had that I just don't have anymore because I don't do the things that they do. I'm sure it's the same situation for you guys. You'll never be the same again, but you'll never fit in. You can run, but you cannot hide for long. Because when I made a commitment to God and I asked him to come into my life and I committed myself to him, he committed himself to me. And although you and I may break our promises a thousand times, Jesus never does. Amen? Amen. And after a while, another saw him and said, you also are of them. But Peter said, man, I am not. And then after about an hour had passed, another confidently affirmed saying, surely this fellow also was with him for he is a Galilean. And Peter said, man, I do not know what you are saying. And some of the other scriptures say that he calls down curses on himself. May God throw me in hell and may I burn alive forever if I know this man. That's the kind of curses that you would curse back then. You condemn yourself, anathema. And Jesus is finding it a very hard habit to break because he's really trying to blend in. And everyone's now talking about it. You get the idea that the word's gone around. That's one of his disciples right there. Are you sure? Yeah, I was in the garden. I saw him. He was the guy that had the sword, remember? Oh, yeah, that's right. Oh, look, he's got a little blood on his clothes. Yeah, I bet you that's him. A little hard to hide the fact. <laughs> Malchus has blood on you. And he brings down curses on himself and he's found out. Proverbs 29, 25 tells us the fear of man brings a snare and whoever, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. You can't trust people. You know that? Just nod your head. People are fallible all the time. They forget things. They, they fall short of things. They commit to things that they fall short on. It happens all the time. Why should I be afraid of people? Why should I be afraid of men? The scripture says in Psalm 56, 11, in God, I have put my trust. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Well, what can man do to you? Oh my goodness, he could beat you up. He could kill you. He can, okay, and then what? And then I'm going to be with the Lord. I'll meet you there. Listen, we have this wonderful little thing called YouTube and we have everything on camera. And sometimes speaking the truth, you put yourself out there and you, I could get persecuted. I might have a prison ministry in my future. Pray for me. It'll be okay. Because I'll never be alone. Because the Lord will be with me wherever I go, just like you. So why am I going to be afraid of people? What are you going to do to me? What are you going to do to me that the Lord himself can't stop? Or what are you going to do to me that the Lord hasn't allowed or ordained? You know, when you understand the sovereignty of God, it is a wonderful thing to rest in because Jesus is still in control. In Jeremiah 1, 8 to 9, God is speaking to Jeremiah and calling him into ministry. And he says, I've got some bad news for you. Your ministry is going to be difficult and you're going to go out and speak to people and they're not going to listen to you, but you got to go anyway. And Jeremiah thought, well, I'm nobody. I'm a, I'm a young person. They're, they're not going to hear me. And he had all the excuses, much like Moses did, much like you and I might, if God called us into service. And what's said is, do not be afraid of their faces. I find that funny. Because when you think about it, I mean, if it's a clown face, I can understand. But why would you be afraid of someone's face? You know, we have become so incredibly sensitive you hurt my feelings. Why? Because you rolled your eyes. <laughs> the scripture says, don't be afraid of their faces. Because acceptance is one of those things that we seek. We like to be liked by nice people and even by angry people. Do not be afraid of their faces. That's a command, by the way. 
for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. And the Lord put forth his hand and he touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. If you're wondering when it gets really, really tough for you, if the Lord's going to be there, remember that passage. The Lord will be with you, whatever difficult hardship it is that you're going to go through. The Lord can be there. But do not be afraid of the faces of people that do not approve of your Savior. Don't let it bother you. Don't let it affect you. Do not be afraid. It's a good word. And immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed, just as Jesus predicted. And the Lord turned and he looked at Peter. Jesus is in the middle of this sifting before Caiaphas and all of the rulers. And Peter's out in the courtyard and they can see each other. And Peter denies him the third time and Jesus looks at him. And I'm sure it wasn't an angry look. I'm sure it was, see, you're not so strong. You're not so tough. You can't do this on your own. It's just like he said. And Jesus probably looked at him with compassion. And it says, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And so Peter went out and he wept bitterly. Can you imagine denying the Lord and having the Lord look at you? I denied the Lord when I decide I'm going to step off and do whatever the heck it is I feel like doing instead of doing what he wants me to do. And sometimes it's a whole lot less than a public humiliation. It's a very private compromise. So Luke 30, uh, 22, verse 31 to 32, if you remember, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked of you, for you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. I wonder if the, if the Lord would say the same thing to you. Satan wants to sift you, Dave. He wants to see if you're really his or not. You know, if, if you're really the Lord's or if you're really the, the devil's. He wants to sift you and figure out exactly if there's any fruit in your life, if there's anything that's true in your relationship with him, and it's going to be tested. But I have prayed for you. You know, Jesus prayed for you that you would not fail. And after you have come back, in other words, once you've repented and once you, you know, get off your face and stop crying, I want you to encourage your brothers. He gives them a mission after his failure. He says, your failure's coming. And then after that, I want you to get back on the horse. I want you to get back doing what I've called you to do. Jesus knows every sin that you will ever commit. And he forgave you for it on the cross. He knows how badly you're going to mess up tomorrow morning. And he died for that sin. If you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you're in him, that applies to you. If not, you'll have to stand before him and give an account for every single thing that you have done in the body. Like a court date. None of us is equipped to do that. Unless Jesus is our defense attorney. In Matthew chapter 26, we get a, a picture a little bit of what had happened. And those who were laid hold of Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and elders were assembled. They were assembled. It's probably midnight, between midnight and two in the morning. Since when are you holding court? You're holding court right now? The Sanhedrin is 71 guys. 71 guys. I don't know if 71 guys, die, you know, gathering at one o'clock in the morning, unless it's a bar or something. But they're ready. They're prepared. Now, the chief priests and the elders in the council sought false, they sought false testimony from, against Jesus to put him to death. But they found none. They were looking for witnesses to make this seem legal. They couldn't even do it. Even though many false witnesses came forward, they found none. By the way, according to Jewish law, you have to have at least two witnesses that agree. 
They couldn't find two guys that agreed. And these were people that were being paid and they couldn't even get their lines right. I'm sorry, line? <laughs> you know, like an actor and they couldn't even get it together. But the last, but at last two false witnesses came forward and they said, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and build it in three days. So that's what he's being accused of saying. And he did say that, by the way. And the high priest arose and he said to him, do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? In other words, explain yourself. This whole thing is a sham court. They're meeting at night, which they're never to do. And if they're going to pass any judgment, it has to wait until the next day. It's kind of a, a neat way to go, but it was at night, which it never should have been. He had no defense attorney that was given to Jesus and he was supposed to have one. He was not allowed any credible witnesses. He arranged false witnesses to be brought in, breaking the ninth commandment, which is you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. So here are all these religious leaders breaking the law like crazy during the Passover to kill a guy. Sanhedrin doesn't render a verdict immediately. They say, go home, eat light food, light drink and wine and sleep well and return and hear the testimony again and render a verdict. It's actually written in their law. So none of this is to happen. And if they find a verdict that's not supposed to stick, you got to give it a day. That's a pretty good thing, right? It's like writing an angry letter to someone. I'm going to, you text them right away. You, blah, 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 blah. don't hit send. <laughs> Close it. Go about your business, pray, have a little something to eat, relax, give it a day, have a night's sleep, look at it tomorrow. Might be that you change some of the words. It'd be a good idea, right? That's a word for somebody in here. I'm sure it is. But Jesus kept silent as they accused him. The high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Now he's been asked, <coughs> he's been asked a very particular question. If you're the Christ, tell us. At other times he said, listen, if I tell you, you're not going to listen to me anyway. If I ask you to let me go, you're not going to do that. So why would I say anything? This guy who's the high priest wearing the high priest robes adjures him before God. It's like when you put your hand in the Bible and say, I'll tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. You're now under oath. And you could be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law if you lie. That's kind of what he's doing. Answer us and tell us plainly if you are the Christ. And Jesus said to them, it is as you said. In other words, what you, you amen. It's exactly what you just said. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man, by the way, that's a term that Daniel uses prolifically for the Christ sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his clothes. By the way, that's a sign of deep mourning, but a high priest wasn't allowed to do that because they weren't his clothes. They were the clothes of the high priest and he wasn't the last guy in line. There's another guy he's going to hand it off to. It's a sacred garment. Not allowed to do that. He has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? Look, now you have heard his blasphemy. What do you think? They answered and said, he is deserving of death. And they spat in his face and they beat him while others struck him with the palms of their hands saying, prophesy to us, Christ, who is the one who struck you? So the courtroom erupts. Caiaphas tears the robe, which he never should have done pronounces death on him. And by the way, they weren't allowed to put anybody to death because the Romans took that away from them because they were killing all kinds of people. And they said, you're not allowed to do that anymore. We take that away. You've overused that ticket. You got too many get out of jail free cards. And so they're pronouncing death on him for claiming to be the Christ, the son of the living God. Why did they crucify Jesus? Because he claimed to be God's son, God's only son. That's why Jesus died. After this, they're going to have to contrive some other reason to have him killed by Rome because Rome won't kill him for a religious reason. So they have to make something up. 